Barry Windsor Smith, one of my favorite mainstream comic book artists, doing a fill-in issue of Iron Man. And I always say, pencils, inks, and colors. If you can get two out of three of those from Barry Windsor Smith, that is a comic worth your time. Excited to look at this one. Hello and welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. We're looking at a, a very fun Barry Windsor Smith comic today, but before we do, I want to remind all of our new audience members that we are a daily comic book YouTube channel. We've been doing this for over five years, which means we have 1,700 plus videos in our back catalog. You can search for those on the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel, uh, the homepage. You can search by character, by creator, by title. I'm sure you'll find some videos that you will love and that talk about the books that you love. I also want to remind everybody that we do have a Cartoonist Cafe Patreon. That link is below this video. We have three different levels that'll get you access to our videos early. That'll help offset the Cafe effect. Sometimes we show off uh, rare comics, hard to find comics. You want to be the first one in line to get those before they disappear or the price goes up. What we call the Cafe effect. And the best way to do that become a King K Faber because then you get access to all of our videos first because you sit in on the recording session, which has become uh, one of my favorite parts of actually recording these, these videos is talking with all the King K Faber. So you can find that link right below this video. All right, Ed, Barry Windsor Smith, one of my favorite mainstream comic book artists, uh, does not have a giant run of anything. You know, he kind of dips in and out of comics, does create her own stuff as we progress into his career. But he did do several fill-in issues at Marvel over the years. And yeah. so we are looking at one of those today, this Iron Man issue 232. This is from 1988, and you see his credit is plot, pencil art, and colors. Yeah. So David Michelini, I think, was the regular writer of Iron Man. Bob Layton, a regular, I guess, inker, sometimes writer of Iron Man. So most of the creative team there, but we get Barry Windsor Smith, an all-star artist, and a guy that Jim Shooter said, one of the few artists that moved the needle when it came to book right. sales. Yeah. So um, a heavy hitter at the time and still to this day. Yeah, yeah. And and I do think, uh, you know, he, he did have a substantial run uh, where he made his name on, on Conan. Uh, Two-year run, and that is a... The, there's a phenomenon there. It's something that I, I speak about with FIFA a, a lot, where like the the sort of blockbuster monthly comics creators, the mainstream comics dudes, almost all of them to a man has a, has a two year run on something where they really establish their name, and that is something that it, like comics does does not have any longer. There's nobody, no consistency on a book, uh, but you can point to dozens of guys who have uh, a two-year run and and two the two-year run there are people who stick around longer but the sweet spot is almost within a 24 issue period it, do, it doesn't extend it, it, it becomes long in the tooth that one is an extraordinary run because he kind of starts out he's very smith. not there yet yeah and by the end it's like barry windsor smith yeah. you know like like you see him mature over that run yeah exactly. definitely a legendary run but also one that's you know 15 years in the in the rearview mirror at this point and he's uh Done a lot of development over that time. Whenever I uh, was a kid and grab, grabbing comics, like this is what what Iron Man looked like. He had the the silver and and the red, and then uh, that's when Dick Grayson was was Nightwing, and uh, I start thinking purposes of, of the channel and stuff, checking out these comics from the time that are like from from our direct childhood, like from the eras that that I was reading. Uh, it made so much sense when the '90s comes around and is like, here's some. Here's your comics, kids. Here's your Spider-Man one and stuff. Because I had the Secret Wars toys of Iron Man, so I had the yellow and red. So, so, so when you get this, you're like, well, this ain't the real Iron Man. And then you have the Adam West Batman, where where Dick Grayson is Robin and stuff. And then when you get the Nightwing, Nightwing showing up, you're like, I'm getting all this like there's stuff that's bogged down with so much history, but I'm not getting the real version because in my mind first impressions are real, you know? Uh, so it makes so much sense that the comics that come like a couple years later uh, are like these kind of like reboot things. And we responded so deeply because these old comics had so much baggage to them. Yeah, no doubt. I love all the directional stuff. So many shapes and, and little lines pointing to our main focal point. I love the contrapposto of that body. Yeah, and I love the coloring. You say like the silver costume, but if you look at that leg, you've got light blue, purple, white, and yellow, and black. All, all on that silver leg, you know, like it's it's one of those things like you would see Colossus or something, even on the, you see it on the face shield as well, the silver face shield with all those colors. Figuring out how to do like metal in your in your 64 color comic palette was uh, 
Always interesting to me. It's brought up often, too, on the channel where you have competing colors from the background and the foreground. And he mitigates that by being the colorist because he can make sure that that's not going to be the case with something like this. And even in shadow, this guy pops. Yeah. Yeah, it's great to see the, the color work because, like, here he's coloring with no holding line yeah, in which... the background, which if he weren't the colorist, you would, you know, it'd be... I don't think there'd be any chance that, that some other colorist would come in and be drawing that stuff at this time period. Yeah, and this is what we associate with the, the Weapon X era, um, Barry Windsor Smith. It looks like if it's not a shifted plate, he's even building in some, like, magenta for, for the, like, a blurry uh, depth of field kind of effect. I wonder, like, the, the poor people tasked with cutting the color separations on a Barry Windsor Smith color job. Oh, yeah. I, I feel bad for him. Like, there, there's a lot of ways that that can be wrong. <laughs> it could be out of line. It could be bad, badly cut plates. Yeah, but... You That's, know, like, drawn exactly. on Exactly, and, 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 so, <laughs> and so are these. Um, so, so I think that there was, like, some, some evolution in, in, um, in te technology a little bit that was, like, allowing for that. So using zips there? Can't tell. Or is Can't that, or is that color, the, color uh, bende? Yeah. Uh, this this is a weird comic, and and I would bet that, you know, two guys are up for the the plot on this, and it is a and then he woke up story, which is the lowest form of storytelling ever, ever constructed. Like there's nothing you get no points for that whatsoever. So it sucks, but the artwork fantastic, and you know it's going there because like this is none of the other comics beyond uh you know the x titles would have these sequences where it was just like pure like dream sequence stuff so this is like you know the iron man version of that yeah i was trying to figure out like where this fits with the machine man limited series that windsor smith does i believe this is after that yeah and if you keep in mind like he's he's working on top of a trimpy there so so he's he's playing more of a, a, a background rule or maybe drawn over top of breakdowns and i think of like the x-men fill-in issues you know like compared to a page like this i wonder if that dream setting was part of like how you get him on this book because it's probably a faster job than a lot of those jobs and it's and it's that, that x-men fill-in some of that stuff looks like it should be about six months worth of work for one issue and this is a guest starring thing so so uh with that what would they would do a lot is um it would be like an aside to to the the a story uh, back 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 then, because because there were rel reliable teams that would, you know, handle the the main thing, but maybe there would have to be some catch up that would uh, go down. See, dude, it's so funny. Like when you see this stuff, and and then you realize like that like Scott Williams was like studying this sh this kind of shit for for his own work. You know, it's it's all there. It was in front of our faces the entire time, and we just didn't pay that close of attention. Yeah, definitely. And for having a story that doesn't have really a story, you do see these beautiful little moments of yeah. storytelling, you know, having the, the mask ripped off and Tony Stark left in that pile of bodies. And I guess this is following uh, a storyline of his technology gets out and is used as like weapons by presumably bad guys, but people die with his technology essentially. And so it's him coming to terms with that, right. you know, the idea that he's responsible for all of this. Whenever the original Iron Man shows up, how great does he look? Right. You know, like that that silver and red costume. Man, that's not my Iron Man. Right. Of course, I'll be honest. I don't have an Iron Man. There's no real run. Even the John Romita run, it's pretty awesome looking. Like, I don't feel that I have an Iron Man, you know, run that I love or I, I, I read have, in time or I anything. Have, yeah, I have more Iron Man comics that, that probably uh, any, anybody I know. And it would be like week four of going to shop and save in a month yeah. with, with, with mom. And it's like I got all the other stuff that I wanted. And uh, I guess I'll grab an Iron Man comic. I should read those Romita Jr. ones because I've pieced together that run, and I think his art looks fantastic on him. And obviously, I think Byrne writes. Well, that's the second run. That, that's the second run that uh, JRJR mm -hmm. did, and that's Armored Wars Two. Uh, take a look. Type in the uh, you hit the magnifying glass. Um, best colored Marvel comic. It's it's like one of the great uh, Armored Wars comics that JRJR draws with John Byrne writing and uh, Joe Rosas on the color, I believe, and it fucking fantastic i am so mesmerized by him almost watercoloring yeah with with the traditional comic palette it's so bizarre i imagine that when he's at gorblimey doing his prints and all of that i i bet you he got such a great understanding of how print really works and i think the best of cartoonists benefit from that uh by by understanding how print works how the surprints are constructed because then you can do things 
you know? And then there's just like weird little choices. Like, I bet you that was an accident. Yeah, it could be. I bet you he was going to start doing something and then he got almost all the page done and was like, fuck. He's got to leave that one. It really makes me wonder, like, how these separations are created. If he's doing separations where he's, like, uh, actually coloring on them or something himself. Right, yeah, from the, on the plates. Like, I mean, that's that's basic. That's what serpents were. So so maybe, you know, like, that's that's what it is. And then, you know, you double up the serpent. Because, like, that would probably be 100% magenta, 100% yeah, that's yellow. My guess. Uh, so then, you know, you just dub, double that up. And then, you know, they'll print from there. At Biscor here, going to have a solo art show with all the best hip hop family tree uh, artwork at uh, the 707 Gallery in downtown Pittsburgh from April 6th through the end of August. If you're going to be in town, make sure you uh, swing through downtown Pittsburgh, check out that art show. I also have the Switchblade Shorties daily comic strip that I'm presenting to you on all of my social media platforms, and there's a dedicated uh, webtoon where you can get the latest Switchblade Shorties comics. Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus, 40% off on Amazon right now. X-Men Grand Design Trilogy Trade Paperback. Three Flavors of Red Room. Crypto Killers Trade Paperback. Trigger Warnings and the Antisocial Network. Jimmy has Street Angel, Princess of Poverty. Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. He's self-publishing some stuff. True Crime Funnies, Black and White Zine, and the 1986 Zine are available at his website, jimrug.com. The Jim Rug Hulk Grand Design is uh, out of print in its treasury edition format, but it's coming to you soon in trade paperback. Now that we're done paying the bills, let's get back to the video. Also, you know, for the uh, the fans of Valiant out there, this is your preview of what's going to be like 92 Valiant, where it's Leighton inking over top of Windsor Smith on some of that stuff. Right. Which is, is kind of weird in my head to think about. <laughs> But uh, this team will get reunited in the future. And, you know, the famous, uh, when I think of Tony Stark, is alcoholic, right? So now he's really confronting those demons whenever it's like, hey, have your drink. Here's your escape. <laughs> <laughs> and it's coming from Iron Man. Such, a, again, bizarre. It's this is some of that uh, that color you're talking about, you know, like putting almost like dabs on your 50% magenta plate on top of that yellow. And when you see that, I mean, that looks like identifiable prisma color marker like the fat end marks that's what that looks like and the fa his face is just full of it yeah you know yeah. this is a something that you would see this kind of mark making a lot in the weapon x stuff that he colors so i am curious like how that gets put together and i also think it's interesting to see that applied to a metallic you know like a robot character and it's still like organic coloring put on top of it even like the hatching and stuff i think of Windsor Smith as a very organic style, maybe a contrast with Scott Williams and some of the people that came after him. It's very organic to me. So to put that on an Iron Man costume is just, it's an interesting mashup. Man, that's, that's a money shot. Pretty strong. A lot of eye candy on these spreads. I think Leighton does good on him. You know, it looks good on this paper. Uh, I, I think that... Um... I think that I could be fool completely fooled, you know, because I, I keep forgetting that he's a part of uh, of this thing, man. But I think he does a good job on top of BWS. Yeah, I think it looks really nice. And I think it is that flexograph printing era because yeah, those dots are big. Yeah, it's that era for and, sure. And uh, that is not always, you know, not my favorite era for, for comics printing, but this stuff looks sharp. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. Because what would happen is um, when you would draw thin lines, and it, you could draw th lines thinner than that. Like Terry, Terry Austin basically had to adjust his style because when he would ink uh, Art Adams, you would see across a chunk of the pages these like new, like wormy lines. And it's because the plates were plastic; they were plastic and they were using heat. So imagine like a super little thin. Yeah. Uh, raised piece of plastic exposed to heat. Of course, it's going to warp. And I, that was something that I was always curious about because the G.I. Joe comics from the era when, when I was a kid would would have that. And I would always wonder, like, well, how is it so uniform across the board? But all the lines don't have that. You know what I'm saying? Like, all the lines don't have it, but is it a hair? Did a hair get uh, onto onto the paper? The fun exercise for people at home is imagine what this looks like with a third-party colorist. Oh, yeah. Because you're not getting these kind of, like, drawn-on pieces of color. Yeah, I mean, we've done uh, several videos, uh, two videos on the same issue, actually, because we forgot. <laughs> uh, but um, where it was like, you know, nobody could color Barry Windsor Smith except Barry Windsor Smith. Look, this is the, um, uh, this is the uh, Umbrella Academy, you know, Gerard Way version of uh, Hulk, you know, with the emo haircut and stuff. <laughs> 
boy, this is not John Romita Jr. in the bullpen uh, no. drawing these characters. Very much like outsourced, kind of, because there's not one discernible Marvel-like line there. It looks like tracing, but like yeah. from somebody who has no context for the yeah, material. That's tough. You know, it's funny. This, this, there are Don Simpson elements oh, that's in true. the Spider Man. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but boys, bit. you go across there. They, they aren't on all of them. And look what happens when you try to take something that was photographed uh, that was in four color. Like imagine if uh, they wow. tried to four color up Dark Knight Returns, it would look like this. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. Um, even like these kinds of choices, you know, to have your saturated colors and like this pseudo circuitry and everything. Yeah. I feel like that's something that a colorist is just not going to come up with that. Mm -mm. You know, that's such a It'll be one color. unique quality that Barry Windsor Smith brought to these comics. You know, that sense of color. It was so different than almost any colorist. Even even some of the good colorists, I don't think they would go in this kind of direction. The, the it's guys, almost pop art. The guys from his era really lamented the, the color. Neil Adams, Howard Chaikin. And you see where they grew, you know, like how Uncle Howie and, and uh, Neil Adams recipes, like when they could play with a million colors, they did. And the radial blurs and the lens flares and all that stuff. Uh, but that said, when, when Neil Adams was e extending the palette on four color, it was very special stuff. So uh, Klaus Janssen, the artists do the best coloring. Um, there, there was one era, like one era. There was a year where uh, I was up for the color Eisner and Emil Ferris, and it was all cartoonists and like Dave Stewart, and and that was good bait to put out there to see what the the venom of people and stuff. Because like the colorists were like, I did this many pages, right. yeah, yeah, and it's like, are we playing volume? Right. Are we playing skills? Because like. <laughs> You know, half you motherfuckers are just playing a coloring book. You know what I'm saying, man? And it was, it was a, we were laughing at that pretty hard. This kind of reminds me of um, Kirby in terms of color, if that makes any sense. You know, because it's like, like the black such, light joints. Yeah, it's it's so it's so saturated. It's almost all your primary colors. Also, like he's doing a bunch of these like two panel kind of pages, and if you look at those like giant two panel pages. It kind of illustrates, like, we're not real. This isn't... Don't judge this story. You know what I mean? Like, we're here to look at, like, these weird, almost psychedelic images. It's the guy's dreams or whatever. Yeah. He does probably rise to the, how do you do a dream comic better than most? Absolutely. Because at least the stuff looks fantastic. Well, yeah. I mean, that's where it all hinges. Uh, you know, it, it can't be uh, rooted in house style, like Mar Marvel comic stuff. The other artist I always think of with Iron Man is Gene Colan, which is another one who I think of as very organic. Yeah. And it's weird to me that these guys that I think of as like more organic somehow are able to do like a metallic character, you know, like a like a metal robot character at a high level. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's well said. And look at that dude. Got the noirish Venetian <laughs> blinds on the face. With a lot of color. You know, like that flesh is like purple, magenta, yellow. There's green as, like, on your, the eyeball. As your uh, lines. Yeah, that's... Uh, fascinating artist like nobody else at marvel or dc is working this way nobody nobody picked this up and said let me try playing around with those color plates yeah just klaus man it's just it's just him and klaus like, and, from, and klaus is really his own style you know yeah. like he's not like painting these like weird shapes um i love klaus's coloring but it's a different approach you know this is just pretty bizarre i'm surprised it works i'm surprised marvel was like yeah you want to do more of that go ahead it only works if you build good name equity it only works if uh it's demonstrable in the way that jim shooter points out Bingo. where yeah this motherfucker sells so i'm gonna pump the brakes i'm gonna let this dude i i think that that is the strength of uh of editors is you gotta you gotta no everybody's not equal and when somebody really shows up you got to give them some latitude this is a horrible picture. It's hard for me to figure out this. It looks but like it's, Eastman and Laird shit it's, or something. It's a birthday cake Barry Windsor Smith had made for Bob Layton, and it makes me really curious. Like, what did that thing actually look like? We got to see that, man. We we live in an era. I mean, we're um, you know I'm connected with them dudes on Facebook. Like, you go through their thing, maybe you find find an image of that. Yeah, put 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 that out there if we can find that. I'd be very very curious what? to see Barry Windsor Smith icing a cake or whatever. <laughs> the way he does it, it looks like Barry Smith, like when he was doing full Kirby. Yeah, that's fun stuff. 
So kind of cool. There's a few other uh, Barry Windsor Smith fill-ins out there. There's some Daredevil and stuff. So probably not the last time we'll check out one of these Barry Windsor Smith fill-in issues. Did he do the f the full Daredevil issue or just a cover? Yeah, he did a full issue. Yeah, I know that one. Not the issue that he does the cover. Oh, okay. It's I a see. different issue. Okay. But I think it might be like Anna Senti's first issue or one of the very first issues she does. So like before the Romita Jr. run in the oh. beginning. We got to dig that out, Jimmy. Yep. Okay, favors like follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. Jimmy and I are on the road to 100,000 subscribers. So if you have not uh, done so yet and you enjoy our content, please subscribe to the channel. Helps us out a lot. We have a Patreon where the King K Favors on the Patreon get access to all the videos uh, before anybody else. Mitigates the K Fave effect and uh, is another way to support the channel. Ultimately, however, our books are the way that uh, we're able to keep bringing you these videos on the regular. Jimmy, please let the people know what you have out in the wild, man. Yeah, best thing to do for my latest comics is patreon.com slash jimrug. It's where I've been scanning and posting pages as I as I do my self-published stuff. In comic shops, you can find Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, and Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. These are my two Street Angel collections. All the Street Angel comics are in these two books from Image, so you can get them wherever you get Image comics or books. Um, the stuff I've been self-publishing, I'm selling on jimrug.com. That's the 1986 zine, the BW zine, and True Crime Funnies, uh, some nonfiction, a nonfiction anthology featuring three stories, including uh, two wrestling stories in there. So you can find those on my website or on patreon.com slash jimrug. And the Hulk Grand Design, that nice oversized one is out of print. However, a new trade paperback is coming out in May from Marvel, and you can pre-order that one now wherever you buy books. And I ask you to please do so because it lets Marvel know to keep these things in print. I'm going to have a solo art show here in Pittsburgh at the uh, 707 Gallery, downtown Pittsburgh, beginning April 6th. It's going to be up uh, through August. So if you are swinging through Pittsburgh, uh, check it out. I, I, I don't think that there's any charge to check it out. And it's all of my best hip hop family tree pieces presented to you uh, as beautifully as we can uh, possibly do it. So this is the daily strip that I've been working on for uh, 2024, presenting it to you on all of, all of our social media platforms. There's a webtoon platform and such. Uh, stay tuned for news on this in the future. And I present uh, material ahead of time on, on my own Patreon. Uh, Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. Uh, you might still be able to get it pretty cheap on uh, Amazon. It was like 40% off fairly recently. Best book I made to date. A uh, bunch of extra pages. If you got the original Hip Hop Family Tree, uh, there's almost 200 pages worth of stuff in here that you haven't seen yet. The X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback is in the wild right now. We recently released Red Room Crypto Killers trade paperback. It contains four self-contained stories uh, in the Red Room universe. There are two other Red Room trade paperbacks. Once again, each of these all contain self-contained stories. So you can start at any place. And if you dig the material, then by all means, check out another uh, Red Room comic. Once again, the, the books are the most important way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. But there are some direct ways to support uh, this YouTube channel. Jimmy, let the people know. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe E newsletter at the links below this video. We'll keep you up to date on new releases and upcoming appearances. You can also buy Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. All good ways to support the channel. Give them those marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.